So hi, and welcome back to another Ether Physics. It's been a while since I uploaded a video. I was working on Maxwell's dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field, but I thought it was a little bit too hard for me to understand because uh, I haven't focused on the electromagnetic field. I have focused mainly on the physical lines of force by Maxwell. Uh, my entire blog, my entire video log, or however we're calling it, this, uh, this Ether Physics, is all about the physical lines of force of Maxwell. And so I wanted to start off with the basic idea introduced by James Clerk Maxwell. The idea is that the ether is an incompressible superfluid. Uh, we call it a two-fluid system because the, fluids, the, the fluid can rotate in two different directions, either counterclockwise or clockwise. And we can call the one positive and the other negative. It, it doesn't matter, we can interchange it, we can change the plus and minus, but the basic idea is that the fluid can be at rest or it can rotate either left or right, or either counterclockwise or clockwise, or we can call that positive or negative. Or right, we're gonna work on this uh, physical lines of force idea introduced by Maxwell. And it's the theory, it's the theory of molecular vortices applied to the magnetic phenomena. The proposition one by Maxwell would be, if in a two fluid system, geometrically similar, the velocities and densities at corresponding points are proportional, then the differences of pressure at corresponding points due to the motion will vary in the duplicate ratio of the velocity and the simple ratio of the densities. It's all, it's all about the ratio, the ratio of the linear dimensions, the ratio of velocities, of the densities, and the pressure due to the motion. Let L be the ratio of the linear dimensions. Let M be the ratio of velocities. Let N be the ratio of densities. And let P be that of the pressure due to motion, the ratio of pressure due to motion. Then the ratio of the masses of the corresponding portions will be L cubed times N. So we have linear dimensions. The length dimension cubed times the density gives the mass of the portion. If we want to know the momenta of that portion, we would say that L cubed times the density times its velocity would give us the momenta of the portion. The L would be a linear dimension. It could be either in the X dimension, Y and Z dimension. So if we would have L squared, we would call that a surface. If we have L cubed, we would call that a volume. If we would have a force, that would be, for instance, a surface times the pressure due to motion. That would give us a force. And if we have a linear dimension and we divide it by the velocity, we would call that time, because velocity is in distance over time. So, if we have a distance and we divide it by distance, distance over time, that gives us just time. So these are the basic ideas, the, the, the fundamental ideas of uh, the incompressible superfluid ether. If L, M, N, and P are known as the linear dimension, velocity, density, pressure due to motion, uh, Maxwell says then the ratio of masses of corresponding portions will be L cubed over N. Okay, that's what we said before. So L squared times the pressure gives us a force, and a length divided by a velocity gives us a time. So if we combine these two ideas, that gives us that the ratio of the impulse of force, so let's write that down, ratio impulse of force would be L cubed P divided by m. Am I right? Yeah. That would be the ratio of impulse of force. And we have now L cubed times P divided by m. And this will be the same as L cubed times m times n. Or we can even make this a little bit easier and say that P is equal to m cubed times n. So a pressure would be a velocity squared times density. What, what this actually says is that the ratio of pressure due to the motion P is compound of the ratio of density 
n and the duplicate ratio of the velocity m squared. And it does not depend on the linear dimension of the moving systems. So pressure has nothing to do with the linear dimensions. Next up in his proposition number one, he says that in a circular vortex revolving with uniform angular velocity, if the pressure at the axis is P0, that at the circumference will be P1 equals P0 plus a half PV squared, where the small p will be the density. Okay, we're gonna write this down. So, where do I have some space? I think we can write this down here. We can draw a vortex with a center, which we can call P0, and at the edge we can call it P1. And P0 is P0 because because of a rotary, uh, rotary motion, uh, the kinetic energy of all the vortex lines, of all the, for of all the particles of ether inside the vortex will be going outside. It's a centripetal force, am I saying it right? So the formula for this will be that the pressure of P1, I'm gonna grab another color, the pressure P1 is equal to P0 plus a half density velocity squared. The half density velocity square part here is the formula for kinetic energy. So whenever we're talking about energy of a particle moving in a direction, and when we have a rotary direction, the particle actually wants to go outside of the vortex, but it can't because, uh, for instance, it's stuck because of the density of the fluid around it. It could be stuck on different ideas. It could be stuck because there is another vortex next to it. But yeah, the pressure in the center of the vortex will be the least and at the edge, at the circumference of the vortex, it will be at its max. So we, we've had this formula before. I think it was in maybe my sixth or seventh ether physics video, I'm not sure. I think that letter, that small p, it's not really a p, I think it's called the rho, rho where rho is the density and v is the velocity at the circum circumference. So the v would be the velocity tangential to the center, so the speed of rotation, we can call that. So if we have an axis here, and we go parallel, parallel to this axis, we can say that P0 is equal to one-fourth rho, oh, I'm writing this wrong, P0 plus one-fourth rho V squared is equal to P2. So whenever we have a pressure somewhere parallel to the axis, we use this formula for that. If a number of such vortices were placed together side by side with their axis parallel, they would form a medium in which there would be a pressure P2 parallel to the axis and a pressure P1 in any perpendicular direction. If the vortices are circular and have uniform, uniform angular velocity and density throughout, then we can say that P1 minus P2 would give us a quarter PV squared. So we're getting somewhere, getting somewhere. If the vortices are not circular, so not perfectly circular of form, and if the angular velocity and densities are not uniform, but vary according to the same law that apply for all these vortices, we can even say that P1 minus P2 equals a constant times rho V squared. So in this formula, the last formula, P, this, it's not even a P, the rho, would be, again, the mean density, and C would be a numerical quantity depending on the distribution, distribution of angular velocity and densities in the vortex. In the future, so this is where Maxwell <coughs> starts to use um, the notations well known to physicists, he says that in the future we're gonna change the CP part, this part, he's gonna write it down mu divided by 4 pi. So a numerical constant, a uh, numerical quantity times the density, uh, it's gonna be mu divided by 4 pi. So that this formula is gonna change 
in a more convenient form. 1 divided by 4 pi and then mu, I always think this is a hard letter to write down, mu and v squared. Okay, I'm sensing that I'm curving a little bit. In this formula, the mu is a quantity bearing a constant ratio to the density and v is the linear velocity at the circumference of each vortex. A medium of this kind, filled with molecular vortices having their axis parallel, differs from any ordinary fluid in having different pressures in different directions. If not prevented by properly arranged pressures, it would tend to expand laterally. In so doing, it would allow the diameter of each vortex to expand and its velocity to diminish in the same proportion. In order that a medium having these inequalities of pressure in different directions should be in equilibrium, certain conditions must be fulfilled, which we must investigate. So this is his proposition one. And as you can see, I already tried explaining this part in an older video of mine, and I thought it would be interesting to continue this idea today in the physical lines of force of James Kirk Maxwell. Maybe I should end this at proposition one and the next video would be his proposition two and I'm already looking forward to it because it's gonna be a hard video, man. Yeah. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Oh, you, di you didn't know, but I'm mostly interested in this physical lines of force by Maxwell. Uh, the dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field of Maxwell is the most famous theory that Maxwell ever wrote. It's still being taught to children or children, to, to, to students at the university nowadays. So that was a very, very strong theory. And uh, it's, it's created by Maxwell. Uh, aside of this theory, so he he said that we can we can write down the theory of the ether and the electromagnetic forces that arises from electromagnetic experiments, and we can write it down in in terms of rotating fluids. The idea of having a rotating fluid uh, and creating force of that is that it's a mechanical idea. It's you realize that all the particles that are in that, that touch each other, all the ether particles that are touching each other have effect on each other over small distances but also over long distances. Talking about a electromagnetic field is easier than talking about a rotating ether that has effect on other rotating parts of ether. You can better say that we have a magnetic field of a certain strength and it affects a electric field of a certain strength. And if we would say that a magnetic field is in reality a rotating part of ether and we would describe the particles of rotating ether, that's, that's harder to do than just say we have a magnetic field and not think about all the, the complicated move, movements of ether particles that come along with, for instance, a magnet bar. It's way easier to just say we have a magnetic field, so we have a magnet, and we would say that the field is at strongest here and the field is weaker at a distance. That's easier than saying that all the particles here are rotating faster than the particles are outside. And especially when you have another field, for instance, a electric field and a magnetic field, and these rotating, rotating particles of ether affect each other. And it's easier to say we have a magnetic field and a magnetic field instead of all those rotating ether particles. Why haven't I been uploading this much? Because uh, last couple of months, uh, last couple of weeks were a couple of, uh, were a little bit hectic here. Uh, I'm still doing this as a hobby. It's, it's as you can see, uh, an interesting hobby, but it's not my main source of, of income or something. So I have a lot of work to do and I do other stuff besides thinking about ether physics and teaching about ether physics. Um, I'm trying to apply for a university, but I'm, the university is far from my home, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna make it. Getting on the university 
and it costs a lot of money to go to university and I don't know if I want to do that I'm still a little bit yeah uh, I'm not sure yet what I should do do because I really like this this idea I really like the the, the fluid dynamics and uh, I hope that one day uh, we understand quantum mechanics for instance in terms of fluid dynamics so it wouldn't be as magical as it is today with a wave particle duality and uh, having a Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger equation which gives us a probability of finding a particle somewhere and I would rather have uh, the idea that we can explain the movements of the ether instead of probability of finding something with a mass or without a mass because I think that most physicists don't even know what mass is and where it comes from. Uh, we all know that energy equals mass times the speed of light uh, squared, but what is the speed of light anyway? Because the speed of light isn't, isn't really a speed of light. It's, it's the way you, you see light behave according to your own personal experience of time. So whenever you go faster your own time experience slows down compared to other parts of the universe around you and so even though you would say that the speed of light is always a constant it it changes i'm not sure if it changes but i can imagine that it changes and but i don't know what you think about it maybe maybe you think the same maybe you think different you can leave in in the comments and Maybe we can have a discussion, or maybe another viewer can have a discussion with you. So, I wanted to thank you all for watching, and uh, have a nice day, man.